and a little bit of paranoia. Welcome to the Iron Sysadmin Podcast. Welcome everybody to the Iron Sysadmin Podcast. I'm your host, Nate, and unfortunately not live tonight, but whatever, at least we were getting you guys a show to begin with. Um, I'm joined tonight by two of our usual co-hosts, Charles and Uncle Mark. How are you guys doing? I'm doing. You're doing. All right. And to clarify, Nate is actually alive. We're just... You I know. said we're not live. I am right. alive. Right. Okay. Mm. <laughs> I just didn't want people to think maybe you had been bitten by a zombie and you were undead or something. Oh, yeah. Or something like that. I'm, I'm the best enunciated zombie on the planet then. Of course, I'd be the only zombie on the planet. So I guess we don't really have any true things to compare to. Well, there'd have to be How at least you... two zombies because one bit you. You got yeah. a point. Got a point. And that's the height of arrogance to assume there's no other zombies. Come well, on. there's no there's no other zombies that we know of. I guess you're right. There could be other zombies. Yeah. Yeah, you don't know. So, um, I'm not going to belabor the fact that I'm very angry about the fact that Zoom and OBS decided not to let me stream tonight. Although, realistically, I am going to complain about that all night long. <laughs> but anyway, uh, tonight on our not live show... Uh, <laughs> We should, ship, we should ship a bonus episode that's just you it's complaining for half an hour. Just me complaining we about could, Zoom. Sounds like a great idea. So It's just old school podcast tonight, yep, right? Definitely old school. old school old school podcast. So I'm going to have to spend like a day figuring out why the hell Zoom all of a sudden didn't even work. But hey. yeah, and, so, and no one will see video from tonight at all? The video will never land uh, anywhere? What I'll probably do is take the podcast audio recording of the podcast and release it as one of those you've probably seen them uh where where folks take their podcast and just overlay some sort of a stupid animation for the video and post it to yeah, youtube i don't care in That's other probably... words they're not gonna they're not gonna see me in my dungeon master no sweatshirt. no they're not gonna see my command line hero shirt either so weak or weak. charles's hospital chair where dad waits yeah <laughs> well hospitals don't buy cheap chairs from ikea are you sure? No. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a fun night. So on tonight's show, uh, in case you guys didn't realize, we're recording like two weeks before Christmas. And um, I thought it'd be fun to have a show where we basically talked about a Christmas wish list for the geeks in your life. Um, granted, most of our listeners are those geeks, uh, but you can certainly share this show <laughs> With folks uh, who may be buying for geeks, see that, see that, promote the show, mm. and and uh, and mm. we can go from there. Uh, so, uh, I've put together a handful of ideas that I think are pretty cool, and so have Mark and Charles. And let me just go ahead and delete Jason from the list with great conviction. <laughs> wow, that that made Google Doc shake a little bit on yeah. my screen. Wow, that's pretty so hard. That's pretty cool. So, so yeah. All right. Uh, with all the technical difficulties, we didn't really discuss how we were going to present this list, I suppose. So I think what we'll do is I'll take one, and then Mark, you can take one, and then Charles, you can take one, and we'll just work through our lists until we run out of things to talk about or until we think we've gone on for long enough. And with the Iron Sys admin, as our longtime fans know, that can be a very large number. Yeah, realistically, we never know when it's been long enough. Maybe Charles can tell us when to stop. We usually hit long enough, and then we keep going a little <laughs> bit past that. Charles is the only one, I think, in this crowd with enough self-control to know when to stop talking about something. So, uh, the first thing I put on my list, and this is mainly because I'm actually buying one of these this year for Christmas, because my 10-year-old daughter asked for one. And it is a 3D printer. So I've always wanted a 3D printer. I just never wanted to put the money up for one. Uh, so when she started asking for it, it was a perfect excuse to go and uh, take some of that bonus money and put it right into a 3D printer. <laughs> so uh, what uh, what I ordered was a Ender 5 Pro after talking to a number of folks uh, who own Ender and own other, uh, other brands of uh, 3D printers. And uh, the Pro is what I decided on. And then on top of that, on Black Friday, there was a crazy deal where they were taking like 20% off. I don't know if that's crazy, but it was a pretty good deal. Took the price down to just over 300 bucks, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, list price on these is almost 400 So, mm. you know, pretty cool. Uh, um, we have it wrapped already and 
sitting hidden in a closet. So uh, I am just as much looking forward to Christmas Day as my daughter might be now. So uh, that should be good. I think it should be a cool thing. And I started looking more and more, and Mark, you're aware of this because you have one right there in the background, uh, 3D printer. But uh, I started looking into some of the uses. I mean, like I was already aware of some uses for 3D printers, but some of the crazy stuff you can find on Thingiverse, which is, for anyone who's not familiar, a collection of things that people have made models for for uh, 3D printers and published for people to download and use. Uh, then this, the stuff that you can print on these things is just amazing. Everything from yeah. like, oh, here's a here's a hat rack, to like, um, as you guys are aware, I own a Jeep. Somebody has made so like the doors come off Jeeps, right? One of the problems when you take the doors off the Jeep is you need to put them somewhere that doesn't damage the paint on the door. Somebody made clips that you can clip to the bottom of the door so you can set it down on the concrete or the macadam and it doesn't nick the bottom of the door up. Brilliant. <laughs> so, you know, that's what I'm looking forward to. Maybe not that specifically, but that's the first thing on my list. So, Mark, what do you got? So, oh, so we're, okay, we're doing round robin. We'll do Aren't round you robin. Okay. Paying attention? I oh, was right. paying attention. I'm just verifying. So, I have to be honest, pretty much everything on my list right now is stuff I already have. But That's fine. There's some of my favorite geek lame. things in recent memory. And and the top item, did you just say it was lame? No, I said same. Oh, same. Okay, good. Well, he's, he said lame. Oh. Fight. Come on. Oh, no. <laughs> like, shit. Charles said I was lame. I, I'm going to... No. Why do we hate Mark? What? 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 Yeah. <laughs> So the first item on my list is, in fact, the newest thing, and that is the video game Cyberpunk 2077. It actually just went live yesterday. I thought it was going to be going live at midnight last night, but it turns out midnight GMT is around dinner time in the United States. Sweet. So I actually got, I actually got to play for a few hours last night without making questionable decisions about bedtime. <laughs> um, I... Um, I have to. I, I gotta say, Charles and I were talking about this a bit while you were cursing the setup. Mm. It's a. Uh, it's an open world RPG. It's not as open worldy as some stuff. I mean, there are. There's a, there. Okay, I got to be careful how I say that. It is not as sandboxy as some games. In other words, there is a. There is a certain amount of emergent gameplay, but the the best part are the are the quests that are already there these are the same folk who brought you the witcher although you can run across random events happening and 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 you can cause chaos on your own as well but it's not like minecraft level of sandbox like some open world games are totally sandboxy i it, i wouldn't put it in that category what it is is it is beautiful the graphics are amazing um i have a very beefy rig and it runs great on it combat feels really fantastic and the nerd the mini games like the the hacking and some of the other stuff and the stealth are pretty cool and it's even got crafting in the game where you can make and upgrade weapons and gear and software for your cyber deck i am not yet through the prologue so i am very <laughs> early in the game is this uh can i buy this through steam or uh where so i can i get I, this? I bought it through steam it's available on pretty much every platform right now other than the switch so uh pc and then both both of the most recent generations of the xbox and the playstation uh i don't know if the native ps5 current xbox is available yet but it's a free update if you buy it if you have a newer console and then later on you can get the native version uh, apparently there's this a lot of games are doing that where the the, the ver if you buy the current gen version which would be playstation 4 in my case uh you get the ps5 version for free if you've done that within a certain amount of time but uh you do need a pretty beefy pc if you're not getting the console version and there's apparently some bugs and stuff because you know it's it's an ambitious game Witcher, which is Witcher Three, which is regarded as one of the best video games ever, mm -hmm. still has still has uh, not as many bugs, but it launched with a healthy bug list. Cleaned it up to much better than Skyrim ever got to, but you know, <laughs> big games are these big games are complicated. But I'm 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 happy with it. So, so of course I'm looking at it on Steam right now, and from the videos, man, that that the graphics are quite stunning pretty damn cool what i will say is it is not a child-friendly game at all 
Well, I mean, I had to put in my birth date before I could look at the page, so that made me... No, well, so so <laughs> character creation, you get to decide if you're a if you're like a Barbie doll, it's all smooth, or if you've actually got junk. And then there's a slider. So, <laughs> what sort of junk? <laughs> uh, yeah, let's just say that your characters yeah, can be they, anatomically correct. Right, right, right. And no, the I, language... meant, I, meant, I meant the slider. The slider yeah. says, how would you like the junk? Large. <laughs> Small, medium, large. Right. Um, right. Nice. And then the, the language throughout is very spicy. Okay. There's, there's, so it is not a kid-friendly game. Well, I have added it to my wish list on Steam, and I'll go back and check it out a little more in-depth later. Yeah. Pretty cool. All right, Charles, what do you got next? Um, <clears throat> this isn't really a new thing. I'll just throw it out because I feel like this question comes up in my various friend groups. Um, Google Wi-Fi. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is a mesh network offering. You get these, you know, you get the buy a puck at a time. You know, these these little Wi-Fi pucks that are about the um, oh the size of like you know a giant cookie. You know, they're like maybe six inches across. Um, now I'm hungry. Yeah, yeah, I'd say I'd say they're like as big as a hockey puck. So the word puck is yeah, maybe a little maybe a little bigger. A little but, bigger. Um, no, um, I got mine last year. Um, they cover my, I have three of them. They cover my house, all the floors, backyard, easy to set up. You know, I didn't try to do any kind of advanced configuration with them, but uh, I, I do not have, unlike a mutual friend of ours, I'm not instituting VLANs in my house. Um, <clears throat> I Who just would need do my, that? I know, right? <laughs> I'm just trying. We should have him on sometime. Um, I'm just trying to get my stuff to work. But you're talking about someone else than I am, I guess. <laughs> I know nothing. I'm talking about a, uh, a certain network engineer that also, or previous network engineer that also co-hosts our show. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm talking about a certain former web developer. Um, oh, really? Okay. Oh yeah. I know. I think um, I know who you're talking about then. <laughs> but you know that. So for like 200 bucks, you know, you can bring mesh networking throughout your whole, you know, reasonably sized house, like a couple thousand square feet. And uh, you don't have to screw around with extenders. Um, links up pretty well with your existing router if you just turn the radio off on any existing router that you have. And Yeah, you know. so... Um... You and I probably talked about this before you bought it. At least I vaguely remember you and I talking about this. I, asked I also, your, yeah. I also I asked for your recommendation. Like, yeah. Yep. So and I've um, been really happy. The the Google Wi Fi the, the the base unit is meant to act as your router. So you could, depending on what sort of internet service you have, you just connect it directly to your cable modem or your DSL modem or whatever, and off you go. Right. You don't have to have any anything in between. Uh, and then you can, there is also a network port on the back that you can then connect to a switch. Mm -hmm. So if you have a wired network as well, you can plug that in and that works just fine as this thing as its, its gateway. And that's what I did because I already had a bunch of stuff running off of that, um, running off of that switch. I had all my port forwarding set up. So it's basically like, okay, and for user land, use the, um, yeah. you know, use Google Wi-Fi. Yep. And it's been really solid. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty cool. And I like what I liked about it was how easy it was to. I mean, there's an app on my phone. Mm -hmm. I just set the thing up through the app on my phone. There's no weird like web UI I gotta log into. I don't know if it even has a web UI. No, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> not not that I have ever had to use. Yeah. Um, the thing I love about it most, and this doesn't apply to you, of course, is the the, the bedtime schedules. I can set it up so mm. that so that it cuts off my kids' devices or their TV. <laughs> You know, at, at nine or nine or ten o'clock at night, so I can so they actually go to sleep at night instead of uh, instead of sitting up watching their damn tablets. So, okay, that's handy though. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's really nice. It's really nice, and it, so, it's and it's really easy to like, you know, like if we're being nice and letting them stay up late, just hit a button and it'll extend it by half an hour. That kind of thing. You know, it's not like I have to go change the whole schedule. Does it have any of the Google Home stuff integrated? Like, can you yell at it, or you're just yelling at a puck? It itself does not, no. Okay, because we have a couple of Google Homes. 
I have a classic you, wireless router and I have one extender that Char like Charles is talking about, but it's actually a separate Wi-Fi network. Like my yeah. network's M Richter and the extender's M Richter underscore EXT. And that sometimes gets old. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll, I might actually have to look into this, Charles. Thank yeah, you. That, so, yeah, that solves for that problem. And yeah. There are other, uh, other, other competitors in this space too. Um, Ubiquity has one. I forget which one Jason went with, but he did like exhaustive research before he got his and being a network guy, it was just, you know, I forget. Did he get the ubiquity? I don't remember now, but uh, I went with the, 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 at the point where I was getting the, where I was buying this thing, I was, I was in a, I don't want to have to think about technology at home mode. And that's why that's one of the reasons I bought it. And it has been perfect for that. It's been, I've got Wi-Fi. It does all of the technical stuff that I've wanted it to do, and if I don't care about it, it's out of my way. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, then. The next thing on my list, maybe you guys have heard about this. It came out uh, maybe a month, month and a half ago, is the Raspberry Pi 400. I... Which one is that? Refresh my memory. So this is a... So the Raspberry Pi 4, of course, has been around for a while. Like a year, I think. Right? I don't remember now. But anyway, it's been out for a little while. Uh, time, and that's, time blurs and that's, lately. And that's like your usual, um, you know, Raspberry Pi. I'm holding one up for the screen that no one's ever going to see except Mark and Charles here. But, you know, but the I usual Raspberry Pi, size of a deck of cards, Ethernet and, and USB ports on it and whatever, and a, and a block of GPIO pins so that you can connect various things you want to control with the Raspberry Pi. Well, the Raspberry Pi 400 is the same thing except it's built into a, a different form factor and integrated into a keyboard. So if you remember the old days, right, when you'd, you'd plug your, your all-in-one computer into your television set at home, this is kind of the, the feel that this brings back. It's, a, it's an all-encompassed, um, whatever, all-included machine that has an HDMI output that you plug into any HDMI-compatible display. Uh, you turn it on. And off you go, right? It's, it's a got, key, but it's a, so it's a keyboard. Essentially? It's a keyboard. It is a keyboard, and inside of that keyboard is a Raspberry mm -hmm. Pi. And the even cooler thing that I thought was awesome when I was watching some of the intro videos I'm about gonna look this at the thing link. is on the back of the keyboard are the exposed GPIO pins. You can still plug in devices to the thing, right? So anything, oh. anything that's compatible with a Raspberry Pi's GPIO, you can still plug it into this and tinker with those devices in the same way you would with the normal Pi. Now, obviously, if you're building an embedded system or something, um, maybe you don't want the keyboard and whatever. You'd go back to a normal Raspberry Pi and plug in an external keyboard when you need to. But, you know, imagine you're building a thing that does need a keyboard or you just want a computer to to be able to prototype things on or whatever. This thing's perfect. That's Perfect. fascinating. So I think it's pretty Perfect. cool. Perfect. And the the fact that it reminds me of you know Nate, little kid in the eighties with his Texas Instruments uh, computer plugged into the living room television. Um, right. You know that's that's just another piece of nostalgia for me. I think it's a pretty cool little product. Because kids today won't appreciate that. No. What you had to hook, you had to hook your computer to your TV. What 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 witchcraft is that? Yeah yeah, and it only had twenty four lines and eighty columns. Uh, <laughs> and you legit i mean woof we were we were professionals at getting eye strain then yeah that's awesome i actually want one of those now so i want charles's first gift and i want nate's raspberry pi keyboard see i already this is own, perfect i already own a 3d <laughs> printer which has been busting my chops and i got a when i opened a ticket with monoprice they ignored it so i now got to get on their live chat with them or something yeah you keep uh, uh, you keep saying you're going to do that and you haven't yet <laughs> <laughs> well, my big focus lately has been on getting the dishwasher fixed because that's a little more important. That might be more important. So uh, there's a thing I'm going to talk about in chat that you're that's going to make you want to fix your 3D printer. I'm just, just saying Dude. that. Great. <laughs> Great. All right. So, Mark, what's the next one on your list? So this is something I've been enjoying for a little bit of time now. Um, I like to read and I've. I've used the Kindle Fire app on my phone or on my computer every so often, but I, I never bothered picking up an e-reader and I'm not really a tablet person, but I finally, I finally pulled the trigger when 
it wasn't a Black Friday sale because it was, be, it was before that, but the Kindle Fire, the, the I think it's an 8-inch HD or whatever. I put the link in, in the chat of the one I actually bought. I just pulled it from Amazon Order History. Uh, very cool. Getting the Fire has renewed my book reading interest, which is, is, is nifty. And again, not really a tablet person, but it's functional enough that I can, that I, it's got the web browser. I can play chess on it. You know, me along with half the country got re-addicted to chess <laughs> thanks to the Queen's Gambit. And it's, uh, it's a neat book. To me, it's, a, it's like, I'm a big fan of devices that do one thing and do it well. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't care how functional it is, is you know, playing games or doing email because I just don't care. I don't want to do that on it. But there are, it's, you know, it, so it's I have, good, good for what it does. I have, well, I've had for quite a while a, a Samsung tablet that I got for quote unquote free from uh, Verizon when I added a line at one point. <clears throat> so it's got a data plan as well. And I almost never used the thing because it was just kind of a slow and clunky because it was a free tablet. Right? You, you get what you pay for. Um, but I used it in the Jeep for trail maps and whatever. And uh, when I decided after I no longer had the commute that I used to have and I started reading books instead of listening to them, I decided I'm going to start reading books, uh, ebooks now instead of instead of doing the audiobooks. So I upgraded the tablet to a newer Samsung tablet that was performed a lot better and also still doubles as my trail tablet. And um, I have to say that, like you, I'm not a big tablet user, right? It is handy to be able to pick up and use from time to time. But the ability to have an endless number of books at my disposal when it's linked to a cloud service, or honestly, how big is an ebook? An endless number of books stored locally on the thing for if you're on an yeah, air, you know, flight or whatever, um, is really handy to just be able to pick it up and read. And uh, again, if it's a cloud service, if I don't have the tablet handy, I can read on my phone if I'm like, you know, whatever, somewhere yeah, I don't have my tablet. And, and I've got a nice phone. I've got the 10R, but... For some reason, it's just, it's not big enough. No, Mark, who's read for years, wants, wants the slightly bigger form factor. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And that's one of the reasons I did the tablet. Well, I upgraded the tablet uh, instead of just using my phone when I started reading. Because, again, I have a pretty big phone, the Pixel 4 XL. Oh, we know. You but set not, the slider to large. Huh? Yeah, but it's not quite, it's not quite big enough to read on. I can read on it, obviously, but it's not. It's not as comfortable, yeah. I don't think. Yeah. I also like when I'm using the Kindle and I'm not, not using my phone, the Kindle's not nagging me. I'm not seeing notifications about anything else yes. from the apps on my phone. So it gets me in a different mind, that does, uh, mind mental state. I do notice that when I pick up the tablet, right? I'll pick up the tablet to read, right? And then I'll pick it up and I'll be like, oh, there's a notification. I'll go look at that. Oh, somebody posted on facebook i'll go look at that and that turns into half an hour of looking at facebook because facebook is freaking addicting uh yeah. because that's what it's for uh, <laughs> but um yeah so having a normal reader that didn't have those notifications would probably be nice all right charles charles you're up oh speaking of books um <laughs> uh, i'm gonna plug the laundry files series by charles strauss um this is uh, the, the conceit of this series, which is uh, up to like 11 books. You know, he's been writing these since like the early aughts, um, is a universe, essentially our universe, but con contemporary day, but where Lovecraftian horrors are real and magic is accessible magic is basically just advanced mathematics and computation but um your initial point of view character is basically an it guy oh that's who, cool who eventually becomes something of a computational demonologist um but it's so it's british so it's also got this whole kind of like it's sort of like the office i mean i haven't seen the office but i've heard it's like the office like there's just a lot of like low-key hr bullshit throughout the whole book and succeeding books but but then you know also lovecraftian horrors monsters so, and magic all the heart for lovecraft and i just bought the first book and it's been delivered to my personal fire already so <laughs> yeah these are these are fun um i've read them all i enjoy them 
I have them all, but I've read, I have all uh, paper copies because I have read things on the Kindle. I can read things on a Kindle. I just never find it. Like, I'm not being a traditionalist or a contrarian, you know, just for that. Say, I just, I find it more satisfying to I actually like hold a physical book. What That's you fine. can't, what you can't see is the giant pile of books right here off camera. Yeah. You, I, yeah, yeah. I, I usually am a fan of books. I, this is, let's see here. Uh, yeah. So this was, uh, this was probably the fifth or sixth time I've bought the stand. This is not a ver this is a relatively new copy of the stand extended edition, which I bought earlier this year because mm -hmm. I wanted to read it again. I, I, I love classic books, but yeah, the other issue is my house has got, my house is kind of dark in a lot of places. I guess I could just buy some lamps, but buying the Kindle <laughs> fix that problem regardless. Of what See, we bought lamps. I guess I could just yeah. buy some lamps. <laughs> because you know, we've got books, we have bookshelves everywhere. Like you, honey, you're looking at like the camera is showing some of the only walls in this house that do not have bookshelves on them. I can believe it. I've been in your house. You do have a large number of books. Large number of books. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, a coworker of ours, when I worked with you at the college, was also reading the same series, The Laundry Files, and he was he he was yeah. very happy with it as well. He liked it. Maybe he yeah, heard about he, it from you, or you heard about it from no, him. No, no, I heard about it from him. Okay, so you've read through them that quickly. I mean, well, that was like two, three years ago, I guess that he started. It's been that. a couple years, and yeah, Charles I, seems bright. He oh, that's right. That. You're the guy that read like a thousand page novel on the drive to DerbyCon. Now I remember. <laughs> no, no. Let's no. Let's tell it right because the Forever War is not a thousand pages. But it's I forever. started. But I started reading the Forever War when we left Easton, and I had it finished. Um, I think by like lunch. Yes, you did. Freaking insane. How so? How long is it if it's not a thousand pages? I don't know. Let me go find my copy. I just um, remember it was enormous. It was a huge you book. You guys vamp for a second. It was um, like it was like we we had to pick somebody up in well we had to pick Charles up in Easton and then we picked another another previous coworker up in Easton, and as we're there uh, at the other coworker's house, he's just like looking through his bookshelves and he comes across this book and he's like, oh how is this book? Oh it's great. Can I borrow it? Sure. So you know I assume Charles is going to spend the next two weeks reading this thing. He starts reading it as we get in the car to drive to DerbyCon, and like, I don't know. Well, like he said, by lunchtime he's done, and we're we're like, you're you're what? <laughs> oh man, it's like three hundred pages. Oh, Is that's not. Really? I could do that. Yeah, that's it easy. It looked it looked much larger. Nah, yeah, that's Granted, what she said. I was no, I was <laughs> driving. Not, yeah, right. <laughs> but no, it has, to be, it has to be said. I read very quickly. Like I Obviously. knocked out the I knocked out the Phoenix Project in one night. Do you get that same sad feeling I do? Like when you're enjoying a book and you realize, oh my god, there's only like ten pages left. Yes. Yeah. I That's I get a... the same way. Whether it's audiobook or well, audiobook's even worse because you don't you don't get the same feel for how much is left. Unless you're looking at the progress bar, right? I guess with an yeah, ebook, it's, it's similar, not even the same, dude. It's not even close to the same. Yeah. That feel when you realize you're almost out of paper and you're like, oh, I'm going to miss these characters. Speaking of, I want to plug uh, Pandora Star by um, Peter, Peter Hamilton. Okay. It's, uh, it's um, science fiction. It's not new. Uh, yeah, he wrote it like 10, 15 years ago. But I didn't have that feeling because it's a two-parter and each one is like a thousand pages. Nice. Mm. It doesn't feel over long, but like it's it sticks around a while. Maybe so maybe we need to have a book club uh, episode. <laughs> maybe it's nerdy. It is. It is. That's All right. awesome. So the next one on my list is the Pine Phone slash Pine Tablet Pine Tab. I guess they call it. Um, this is not your usual smartphone. It is a a open source. I believe open hardware phone slash tablet, which runs Linux or various other distributions of whatever. It does not, as far as I'm aware, because I did look into it just recently, it does not yet run like a normal phone OS like Android, uh, but it does run a, an actual Linux distribution. So I don't know if I would call this a great daily driver phone, but it could be a great phone to just sort of tinker with. And it's priced, 
in a price point that is perfect for a device you want to tinker with because they start around like 100 bucks or 150 bucks. Um, I know if we were live and uh, and Josh were watching, he'd be cheering right now because I know he loves uh, he loves these devices. But they have a phone and they have a tablet. I get the feeling that the phone is a newer device. I haven't looked that deeply into the tablet. I just saw they had it on their site. The tablet is actually cheaper than the phone. So looks like a neat little device if you want to have Linux in your pocket or if you want a little device that has a full OS, a full Linux OS on it instead of a, a sort of hampered um, Linux, which is kind of what you could call Android. So, yeah, Pine Phone. That's the next one on my list. We seem to have lost Charles. He walked away. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. All right. So, Mark, what's next on your list? Oh, what so do you this know? One, it has yeah, to do with well, barbecue. And I've told, if you're a fan of the Iron Sys admin, and if you're listening, you probably are. <laughs> you, you, you might have heard me talk about my love for smoked meat, and you've probably heard me mention the Flame Boss. This is a very niche market, but I, I feel like. A lot of nerds do like, do like, you know, barbecue and smoke meats and stuff like that. And this is, this is one of those devices that I can honestly say, I don't know how I would like it, it to the way I cook. Uh, I got a big green egg of it. It'll be two years in June and amazing purchase. Lots of, a, a great, a great smoker Komoda style grill. It became clear that if I wanted to do the long cooks, especially the overnights, that I needed a better way to handle it than checking the temperature manually every couple of hours, especially mm -hmm. overnight. And the Flame Boss is a fire and forget. It's um, basically it's a Wi-Fi controlled fan. It you, you mount it. There's there's mounting hardware and, and it pops on and off. It's not permanently mounted to the grill, but you use a, a plate that's got a hole in it. And you slide that into the into the intake. Uh, hole, vent, whatever the hell it's called, mm -hmm. and then the the unit itself hangs on that, and it has probes that measure the temperature of of the grill, as well as you can have probes for the temperature of whatever you're cooking, and you can control it all via the cloud. You know, oh good, <laughs> yeah, you can secure it. You can share your cook progress, yeah, so people can get a read only view of it, and if they have your credentials, they cannot they could they could mock with it, but you know. That's your own damn fault if you let them do that, or you can control it with your smartphone. And uh, you can even say, you know, when the meat gets to this level, drop the temperature to keep it warm, and it'll it'll do that. It's it's pretty amazing. Uh, there's a big genius, but it's based on the flame bus technology. So if if you're at all into to low and slow cooking. Uh, but you want to amp up your tech game around it, the Flame Boss is the way to go. Uh, Big Green Egg, Komodo Joe, many other many other smoker-type grills. And if you're not eating smoked meat, well, I feel a little sorry for you. Because yeah, you probably delicious. should, right? So it's you delicious. you had cut out for just a minute when you said, I think you said that you have a, a, <clears throat> a brand name that is not Flame Boss. Is it like a, a, a less the, expensive um, brand or what? Well, it, no. So so Big Green Egg, the company, they, they OEM it. Oh, they okay, and they slap their name on it, and then pay you pay more for it actually than if you just did the generic flame. <laughs> okay, it's called the so egg it's a genius. It's a flame boss, but it's, it's rebranded as the egg genius. The egg genius, but okay. The yeah, when you when you go to the web page and you use the app, it's all the, the flame boss name is integrated in it as well. But it is, it's worth every penny. It probably saved my marriage because. <laughs> the because when I had my old Wi-Fi, not Wi-Fi, but wireless temperature alert, and the alarm went off at two thirty in the morning, Sharon was she was about to kill me. Cause yeah, the, right. It was out of temp. She's like, "You can't do this." And you know what? She's right. That that wasn't that wasn't so great. I didn't yeah. like getting up. I liked even less that it woke her up. Being, and now uh... I can do overnight smokes without waking the family up. Being and paged in the middle of the night is certainly something that most of our listeners are probably used to, but right. most of them probably aren't getting paged by meat. I mean, the good part is that if you're getting paged by meat, at the end, there's something very tasty, as opposed to being on a bridge from hell with senior leadership and whoever, but and yeah. multiple vendors. But, you know, depending on uh, who you work with, that may end at a, at a nice restaurant or something. Sometimes they're actually grateful, Sometimes. believe it or not. 
<laughs> All right. So yeah, I've been I looked at the flame boss myself, and I really want to find out. Uh, as you know, I got a not as nice a smoker as as what you've got there with your big green egg, but I do want to start tinkering with smoking. And uh, I want to find out if I can find a flame boss that is compatible with the smoker that I have. So, well, check out Flame Boss's master site and uh, and see and you know see what they have to offer. And I know there's been folk who've done open source, open hardware variants. I did look you into know, that. Homebrew. And the the problem. I shouldn't say problem. It's outside. Challenge. Of the, it's, it's a challenge. Yes, it's outside of the scope of the stuff that I usually work with. I usually work with stuff that's controlled by things like a Raspberry Pi, that is not a real time OS, right? Ah, uh, okay. Whereas things like that are better controlled by something that's a real time, you know, controller. Um, so I'd have to learn, basically, which is not a big deal. But learning you, is for simp's. When you consider all the components and all the learning I'd have to do. The price of the flame boss really isn't <laughs> isn't that out of line, right? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't cheap, but yeah. oh my god, talk about return on investment! <laughs> oh yeah, I bet. So yeah, once I once I've gotten a little bit of practice with the smoker in um, on smaller projects that don't require overnight smokes, uh, then I, I may look into one myself. But, right, and and I never recommend that you jump in. It, it, like I made the mistake of uh, trying to smoke our turkey for Thanksgiving last year. And it was the single biggest attempt I ever did. And it was like basically writing code live into production without <laughs> even making sure it compiled. And it bit me hard. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, always, always, always do test runs. Right. Well, so what what I meant was the opposite, was that I don't want to invest a bunch of money into the Flame Boss until I've done right. a couple smokes. And also, that's, and those that's smokes are going to be simpler some, things than a turkey. <laughs> do some, do, and do some shorter ones, too. Yeah. 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 But anyway, but yeah, a smoking meat barbecuing, I think it's a very similar swim lane to a lot of the other nerd type hobbies that we have. As, yeah, I mean, as uh, computer people, you know, home brewing, smoking, like there's a lot of similarities there. There's a lot of like chemistry involved. There's a lot of timing. There's a lot of like science right. essentially involved, which is certain, you know, certain what sports I think and attracts. hobbies. Very nerd like like scuba diving, I'm told, is a very nerd like hobby. Oh yeah, because it's all about well, it's about maintaining a life support system because the 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 water wants to kill you. The water wants to kill you. Cool. Yeah. There's a lot of science there. So Charles, Flame you're boss. up. Hey. Um, yeah. So I will mention this. Um, like I would expect many of our listeners again have a home UPS, but if you don't. This is a relatively cheap investment and just if you've got even moderately unclean power or even just live in an area of lots of trees. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. So like we got like, you know, last week, um, last week we had a big windstorm, lost power for a couple of hours, but um, I had two of these um uh, APC 600 um, VA UPSs and you know the one that was running like the internet stack downstairs which is like a Google Wi-Fi puck the router cable modem a Raspberry Pi it, it lasted a little over an hour so I was able to get some work done and the one upstairs which wasn't cranking really anything once I safely powered off the PC um, actually stayed live for hours so we yep. had a place where we could charge things if we needed to. You yeah. Know, just, like we're pretty far past the point where a unplanned outage is actually going to kill a computer. Right. You know, we have surge protectors, operating systems are more resilient, but still it, a power interruption can be a real pain in the ass, especially if it was just going to be like a very quick blip and then everything is back on. Yeah. Cause then everything just reboots all of a sudden. Yeah. And, you know, there's just the interruption could cost you a lot of time or you could mm -hmm. be in the middle of the game. Yeah. Um, or a Word doc that you haven't saved yet. <laughs> like so, anything. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, that, you know, that, that preventing that, that kind of interruption, I mean, really can't be underrated. Like this is 60 bucks. You know, it's not a lot. Um, easy to set up goes right into wall power it's pretty close to fire and forget 
You yeah, install we, the cl- um, you install the client software. It will tell you roughly, you know, if if you are running everything you were running now, about how much time you could expect. Take that with a grain of salt. Sure, sure. Yeah, we have. Um, well, this is actually from back when I still had that web host running in the basement. <laughs> I have a, a, I think it's a fourteen hundred or a fifteen hundred APC. Mm-hmm. Uh, smart UPS, and I've got a, I've got things like the cable modem and the Google Wi-Fi, you know, plugged into that. And it is, it's, you don't realize how how much of a convenience it is to keep that stuff up during a power blip, right? Not just mm-hmm. that, but I've also got a machine down there that runs my Plex system, and it's nice to not have that thing get rebooted ungracefully, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's there's like it's a sort of thing I don't touch Possible often. Possible side effects. Right. It's a it's a thing I don't touch often and having to like log into it and make sure that it booted or you know whatever if things don't come up cleanly is just a little bit of an extra hassle that sure I could do it but I really don't want to. <laughs> you know what I mean? Do not want. <laughs> and if I know there's going to be an outage longer than an, I don't know, I could probably get an hour or two out of that thing. Um if I have an outage that's going to last me longer than that, I know to just go shut the things down because they're safely powered right down there in the basement. So yeah, good call. Very, very practical. <laughs> Unlike some of the other stuff on the list tonight, <laughs> except I'm for your wife. Wi- you're, you're very practical tonight with your wish list, Charles. The, the Wi-Fi pucks are practical too. Well, the funny thing is like, I don't know. I'm just, the things that I'm geeky about are not necessarily like technology things. Like, yeah. I mean, I mean, like, I mean, the things like model railroading and football, which are, I don't know. I I would call model railroading geeky. It is, but it's not like I'm going to say, well, you know, here's what you need to buy to get started on model railroading. Is that that? I don't even know where I'd start. Yeah, I guess you've got a good point there. <laughs> All right. So the next thing on my list is, uh, well, also. A book or series of books uh and this i've talked about and jason and i have talked about several times on the show over the years the dresden files if you haven't read the dresden files any of these books you need to pick them up and read them because they are awesome um surprisingly and i charles we didn't talk about you know what books we were gonna <laughs> talk about in the list tonight but it's a very similar series to what you described as the uh, the laundry files uh it's based in modern day or I guess modern day, modern-ish day, Chicago, although I don't know that he ever really calls out what year uh, these books are written in. Uh, They just kind of start in what was modern-day Chicago, I guess, when the first book was written, and they kept on from there. Um, But anyway, it's it's a very similar urban fantasy kind of series to what you described as The Laundry Files, uh, except instead of Lovecraftian uh, monsters, we've got... Like, all the normal things that you think about from folklore, whether it's, like, like Santa Claus or um, werewolves or vampires or, like, just normal, everyday lore, the mythology that sort of society still believes in, right? The Tooth Fairy, like, that, those sort of stuff, those sort of things. Um, the, the Dresden Files are written in a way where it takes all that stuff and... It explains them all, all of those things, from, like, the mortal's perspective, right? Like, he's got four classes of vampires, four different courts of vampires, right? And if you were to take what mortals believe of what the mythology of vampires are, the stake to the heart thing, and the turning into bats thing, and the being uh, uh, unreasonably attractive thing, right? Those are all sort of different facets of vampires in this world. Right. And mortals just kind of got it wrong because they it's like, oh, yeah, I once saw a vampire um, that was unreasonably attractive. I once saw a vampire that was killed by a stake through the heart. I once saw a vampire that was like this unheard of beast. Right. And they just kind of mashed all that together and say, that's vampires. Well, you know, that's uh, in in the Dresden Files. There's actually, you know, like different facets of vampires. A long winded way of saying it's a fun series. Um, I always say that it's like if you were to take Harry Potter and make him about 20 or 30 years older, and in that 20 or 30 years, he's just like beaten up and kicked and and has had a bad lot in life. 
He turns huh. into Harry Dresden. <laughs> you know what? That's pretty accurate. Yeah, it really. I, I is. read the first. I read the first book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a it's a great series. It's a great series. Um, there we're up to book number and and Jason and I got into this discussion on on a recent show. What is it? Let's see, 16, 17. I'm on. I'm currently reading the latest book, which is book number seventeen, Battleground. Um, so there are a lot of books. If you are afraid of getting to the end of a series too quickly, the Dresden Files is the perfect series to start because it could take you, unless you're Charles, it could take you months, maybe even years to get caught up. Or it'll take you at least to dinner. <laughs> so, great series. I recommend it to anybody who uh, who likes urban fantasy style stuff. Um, Charles, have you read them? I don't remember. I have not read them. You haven't. You should. If you like Laundry Files, you'll probably like these. It's not based in, uh, it's not European, though. That's all right. So, you know. All right. Mark, you actually have two more on your list. Do you want to cover them yeah. both? Or yeah. Highlights? So, so one of them's a little vague, and one of them is funny, but not so funny. And Charles and I were talking about this a little before the show, too. Um, don't forget that for, for the nerds in your life, a lot of us are into things that aren't necessarily tangible, but are maybe more subscription-based services. Uh, for instance, you know, I play D and D with some folk. They're they're a fine set of folk, uh, and and I I pay for the through the Roll Twenty subscription for for better access to content and things like that. Um, there's things like you know Board Game Arena. If you're doing virtual gaming again with friends, there's obviously a subscription model for massively multiplayer online games, things like that. Or even like the consoles, you've got, uh, you know, PlayStation's got their PlayStation Plus, Nintendo's got their subscription, whatever. So, so you know, if you're looking for a gift for the nerd in your life, you could say, hey, you know, do you, do you, are you looking for a, a subscription for a year of a particular service or, or, or game or something? That, that tends to add up, right? And, yeah. And, and that could be, that would, there was a time in my life, well, back when I first played EverQuest, that was when I was young and still had very young, very small children, that 10 bucks a month probably was not a wise investment in my limited finance. So I've been know. there. I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> and then the last thing, you know, you'd go to grandma's or you'd, pick up a box under the tree at your own house and you'd shake it. And if it were light and it wasn't making any noise, you'd be like, Oh, it's clothes. You yep. know, there was a time when socks and underwear stunk, but honestly, nowadays they're a welcome gift when you get, when you get a little older. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, um, I wouldn't especially mind. If they, especially if they're fun thematic socks. Like I my wouldn't... wife has, has hit it out of the park with some of my, you know, star Wars or, batman or game of thrones socks yeah i wouldn't mind uh, a new pair of slippers to be honest <laughs> it's one of those things that you don't really want to have to buy but you do because you like to wear them <laughs> yeah I say my wife so... got me a pair of slippers um a little while ago it was for shuffling around the house during the day because you don't really mm -hmm. want to be wearing shoes around the house they're great yep yeah yeah exactly and i find that i'm wearing them a whole lot more since i'm work from home now mm -hmm. <laughs> So, right. yeah, yeah, slippers. All right, so that's pretty much our list of, of I don't know, what did that turn out to be, like 12 or 13 things? Um, I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I hope you guys have a great Christmas and uh, okay. or whatever you, whatever you, uh, you celebrate this time of year. If it's a gift-giving holiday, then here you go. You've got a nice list of things. And we're going to go through our normal transition, and we will be back with our announcements. So we'll catch you guys in just a few. Are you a fan of the Iron Scissorman podcast? If you are, don't forget you can support the show via Patreon at patreon.com slash ironscissorman. Or you can buy merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash ironscissorman. And thank you. All right. So welcome back, folks. Hope you guys enjoyed our Christmas list. Um... I've got a few announcements to go through, and then we'll go on into the usual chat and news sections of our show. So, um, Patreon update. 
it looked like we had lost a patron, but we usually had 18, and now we have 19. And I've been trying to look at this list to figure out who's different, and I don't... I can't tell. It's like I've forgotten. But anyway, 19 patrons for 86 bucks a month, and those patrons are Root is God, Bruce, uh, Robert, Matt, David, Solemn, Trooper-ish, Linux, Sis666, Gimpy B, Ryan, my dog's barking in the background, Mark with a K, Dementor from PowerShell on Linux, John the Nice Guy, Mark with a C, Julius, Andy, J, Charles, and our old friend 22532. Dog's really wanting to get into the show. Sorry, dog, I can't let you in. Somebody else will have to do it. <laughs> anyway. So uh, we want to just say thanks to all of our patrons. Um, that money is currently just being tucked away in a savings account for whenever the show has any more expenses. They pay for things like uh, a little bit of our hosting fees, which is basically rolled up into the hosting fees I use for anything I host, uh, and the, uh, the subscription to Restream that we have now, even though we're not freaking streaming tonight, um, and the, the Libsyn hosting. So very helpful. We get a little bit of extra every month out of that, and that's cool. I'm very happy that the show is paying for itself, and that's really the goal here, because I don't care if we become rich podcasters. Do you guys want to be rich podcasters? I mean, I like money, but, you know. I guess I wouldn't complain about being a rich podcaster, right? Mm. I feel like Patreon's not the way to do that, though. We'd have to get, like, all kinds of cool uh, endorsements or something to be rich podcasters. We have to take out more some... unpopular positions. Probably. And by unpopular, you mean paid for and we have to say them? <laughs> yeah, you know, controversial. Oh, right. I don't like controversial positions. They yeah. are very annoying. And they turn into angry. I don't like yeah. angry. Unless you're talking about OBS. I'm angry at, I'm angry at OBS. I'm not saying <laughs> I like it. angry at OBS. I don't like being angry at OBS because it's been great software up until now. And I'm very angry now. And I still don't know if it's OBS's fault or Zoom's fault. We'll see. I'll figure that out some other time. Uh, all right. So I did want to have I did have one quick announcement about our scheduling for the rest of this month. I know it's short notice, but we've decided to instead of moving the second episode for this month, which would have fallen on Christmas Eve, we're just not going to have a Christmas Eve episode or what would have been the Christmas Eve episode. Uh, so don't expect another episode this month, but we'll catch you again in January. And our next show in January should be January 14th, if I did the math right. And uh, we're going to have Dementor. You might remember Dementor uh, from a couple, well, might be a year and a half, two years ago at this point. We had him on. He was talking about PowerShell on Linux. And uh, he's going to be on again. This time he's going to be talking about home automation stuff using Home Assistant, which is something that's kind of interesting to me at the moment, just because I've been sort of tinkering with it myself. Um, because of the Google struggles I've talked with, <laughs> I've talked about in the past uh, couple shows. So that's about it for announcements. We don't have any new reviews this uh, this 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 time around the show. So uh, if you want to leave us a review, make sure you go ahead and do so on wherever you normally listen to podcasts that accepts reviews. Uh, iTunes is the one I check most frequently, but I do have a nice little sort of aggregation service that's supposed to tell me when new uh, new uh, reviews come in. Maybe it didn't tell me, and maybe does there it? are new reviews. Does it? It. I think it does. Okay. Why do you think? Do you think I I'm don't wrong? know. I'm just asking. <laughs> do you trust it? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I should go recheck. But today was so damned hectic, and then it followed up by the technical difficulties. I didn't really have a chance to double check it because I was thinking that myself when I didn't see any new reviews. But it's not that uncommon to go a couple weeks with no reviews. So. All right. So that's it for the announcements. So, uh, speaking of my Google woes, um, I've done quite a bit of work with, so I had this thought that back, back when I turned off a bunch of my self-hosted services and I just went full into some of the Google e ecosystem stuff, one of those things with Google photos and, um, the recent issues I've had with Certain things they've decommissioned and certain things they've changed have made me sort of backpedal on that, get a little bit of cold feet, if you want to say. Um, I'm not going to completely stop using Google Photos, but I felt like I need a second alternative uh, for places to host all of, or not host, but places to keep all of my pictures. And I wanted something a little more um, friendly than just a, a SIFS share in my basement uh, that I could then mm -hmm. back up. 
So I started tinkering with Nextcloud again, uh, which is something I, I did set up for for photo storage that wasn't uh, something I wanted to put on Google Photos anyway. Um, basically, because we got a new camera and I was we've been tinkering around with photography, and Google Photos scales everything down when you put it up there, unless it comes from from a Pixel device. Uh, so I wanted a place to put that stuff. Uh, but anyway, I, I built the next cloud and I figured out how to back it with. Um, it's not. It's 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 a bucket using the S3 API, but it's not an AWS S3 bucket. It's through DigitalOcean, uh, their Spaces service. And I've started writing some blogs around one why I'm going down this road and two how I'm dealing with the different services that I've decided that I want to try to do this with. And I'm starting with Google Photos. So uh, in the past couple of days, um, I've been on vacation this week. Uh, the past couple of days, I wrote up uh, an article about. Basically, that whole story I just spit out to you, except in a more coherent way. Um, and I've I've started writing uh, another one about basically what I'm doing with Nextcloud. And then I'm going to write a whole write-up on how I set up Nextcloud with that S3 backend, which wasn't as straightforward as you might think. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm, that I'm tinkering with at the moment. I'm having fun doing it. I, As you guys know, I like creating stuff. And I like I like writing. I like making the podcast. I like doing video stuff. So, you know. It's just one of the fun things I'm doing. Let's say I set up the, there's this static gallery site generator called Thumbs Up. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I point that at my, um, basically I use that to create a copy of my photo archive. Um, like, but, you know, to, to actually then be exported into an S3 bucket that's publicly available. And that's worked that's pretty well. That's not a bad way to go. Not it's a bad worked, way to go. It's worked pretty well. My My thought was... I'm not sure if I'm going to do the same thing for Google Docs. I may do it for some of the data I have on Google Docs. And if I do, Nextcloud is going to be a perfect place for that stuff to go to, which is one of the reasons I, I leaned toward that. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that that, you know, if I don't go that way, you know, if years go by and it's still just Nextcloud sitting there, I may look for a, a, a simpler uh, and even cheaper solution for the photo hosting. Just throwing stuff in an S3 bucket would be cheaper than running a website in front of uh, the S3 bucket just because well, I, wouldn't, you can, I wouldn't need a server, right? I wouldn't need a server. Yeah, because you can do a static site easily enough. You have an S3 bucket, and then if you, you, know, you stick a CloudFront mm -hmm. distribution in front of it, you can even have um, TLS termination and a nice pretty yeah. domain name. Yeah, I've, I've, I did that with a static site or two mm -hmm. when we were still doing the hosting services that we, that we ran. Um, there were a couple sites we had that were just completely static, no dynamic content, and I was hosting that out of an S3 bucket because it is freaking dirt cheap to do that. It is. I mean, pennies. It's, it's nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's like I've pennies. got like twenty gigs parked there at this point, and it's still yeah a dollar. Like yeah, it's it's something like so. I was looking at I was comparing it to DigitalOcean Spaces. What Spaces does is in, is they tier it where it's like up to. 250 gig or something is five bucks a month. Uh, and I compared that to S3 and it's almost the same, right? 250 gig on S3 is about the same, five bucks a month, if I remember correctly. It was close to the same. So, uh, so yeah, that's, it's, it's pretty cheap considering the amount of space that you can, you can get. And it's, it's in a data center somewhere. Uh, you can turn on versioning so that files don't get lost so easily. There's backup utilities you can run against it to back up the S3 bucket. So, you know, these are, valid things to think about. So, yeah, I also wanted the ability to, uh, like share or not share certain photo content, right? So if it's stuff that I just want a place to put, I don't want it public necessarily, but if it's stuff I want to be able to make public, I want the option to be able to share it with a link and next slide gives me that too. I don't know if your static site thing allows you to do something like that. It doesn't. So, but I've got some scripts set up to export and basically I just have a naming convention to indicate things that I want to exclude so oh, they okay. don't they don't get thrown into the static site. Oh, that's cool. Cool. So yeah, the other thing I've been tinkering with, well I shouldn't say tinkering with, it's just a, a thing that I've found recently. A friend and Mark, you may find this interesting as well because it's RPG related. Uh, maybe you as well, Charles. I don't know how 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 much you are into minifigures, but uh, Hero Forge. <laughs> have you heard of Hero? Have you heard of Hero Forge? Either of you? Mm -mm. Are Hero Forge the ones that got the little bases with the clickers on the bottom? 
Hero Forge. I mean, no, I don't know what you're talking about with the clickers on the bottom. But Hero Forge is a website. Dials, they look like dials. Oh, Hero Forge. Do they make miniatures for you? You you design it, and then they 3D print it? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you, I mean, you're all familiar. Anyone who's ever played an RPG knows character creation is always like, oh, yeah, I want her to be in this pose, and, 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 and I want this hairstyle, and that face... And I want this weapon and, sure. you know, all that stuff, right? Well, Hero Forge lets you do that and print it into a freaking minifig. <laughs> that is, that is cool. Yeah. The, the, they, they recently, I, and we, we actually ordered one for, like, like I've mentioned before, we started playing a and d campaign with our kids. Um, and we actually print, we, we ordered a full color. You can get a full color print of these, these characters uh, we ordered one for my daughter for Christmas. Unfortunately, it looks like it's not going to be here for Christmas because I guess it's just there's that much lead time on how long it takes for these things to get printed out, especially when there's color involved. It's not going to be here until January. But uh, anyway, you can actually print them where it actually it actually prints with colored plastic for the different things that you've asked it to be in different colors. I have no idea how that works from a 3D printer perspective, but that it is what it is. Or you can get them printed just in gray, and there's different levels of, of uh, polymers that you can have them printed in you know, higher quality plastic and lower quality plastic and whatever. Or, and this is what I was hinting at, Mark, that you might want to get your 3D printer back up and working again. You pay them like four bucks and they'll give you the STL file and you can print it yourself. So, right, because the S, the modeling is the part where I would suck. Yeah, exactly. So you just use their creator and then export the STL file and then you can just pop yeah. it into your own 3D printer and print it however you want, right? So obviously you wouldn't get the cool color printing that they're doing. Uh, but the color print figure for just a normal minifig, what are they, an inch tall? 50 bucks. Yikes! With the color. If you get one that's not colored, it's they range from like, I think it's like 15 to 20 or 15 to 30. You know what? You wouldn't have to buy very many before buying your own 3D printer and yes. the printer. Yes. The, it's not ink, but the friggin'. Yeah, the filler stuff. The, the filament. The, what's the word on the Pays filament? For itself. Filament. Yeah. It's filament. Yeah. So um, we bought that one because we didn't have the 3D printer yet and we wanted to have it for Christmas. Obviously, it's turning out to not These be here for Christmas. Yes, that. <clears throat> These wastes of money that are sitting on my thing. <laughs> but I, I thought the exact same thing. With the printer, we'll now be able to. And plus, I mean, if I print out a figure. And we wanted to print 30 of them for some reason. Like if I designed a little orc <laughs> that I want on my on my my mini map, uh, I can print 20 of them on my own printer for the same five dollars that it cost me or four dollars it cost me to download that STL file. The other thing is it's not a big deal if um, a figure gets lost or broken because right. they're you just print another. It's cheap. It yeah. takes time to print, but from a material standpoint, it's very inexpensive. Yeah. So I think it's going to be cool. Um, yeah. I, can't, I can't wait to get the one that is full color just to see how it looks. I don't mind spending that money on a, on a Christmas gift. I wouldn't want to do that for every single D&D campaign I ever run, but no. it is cool. It's like a one-time gift thing, and I think it's going, to be, it's going to be pretty cool once it gets here. So I'm looking forward to that. So... Uh, and related to all that, the other thing I'm working on is, in fact, the thing I was working on today before the show that led up right to the show is I'm converting a room in my basement into sort of a mini maker space for the 3D printer that we saw so a craft out. room. Not quite. My wife it's has a craft a, room. My wife has a craft room, which is so it's more, a man craft room. More normal crafty <laughs> stuff. However, she does have a vinyl cutter, which will probably mm. go into this room because it's like basically what I want is. Things that are bulky and big and need to be set up and take up it's table a space. Craft room. It's okay, fine. It's a craft room. <laughs> <laughs> no, maker space is the, fine. But it's in I the got basement. It. It's not a craft room. <laughs> Doesn't matter what floor it's on. My wife well, has a craft room. Yeah, yeah. Well, my basement. That's awesome. Isn't, yeah. That yeah, having the space for stuff like that where you don't have to break it, you don't have to put it away when you're done with it, is actually really super handy. Yeah. Yeah, that's so a that's, good move. That's the other thing I'm working on, and uh, we were putting lights up down there just, uh, mm-hmm. just, just today. So uh, yeah, Mark, you have anything fun going on? 
So for the past several years, actually, ever since I ran the Cub Pack, we've we started this game day, which originally started as something we would do on Martin Luther King Day uh, with the scouts, you know, come in, bring bring board and card games and play them in person. And we've we've pivoted it to be the, the between the Christmas and New Year's break. Well, obviously, with the stupid pandemic, the last especially the way Pennsylvania is now in a garbage fire. The last thing we're going to be doing is bringing scouts together in an enclosed room to, to breathe in each other's face to play board and card games. Why? So that sounds like a great it's, idea. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. Well, if you want to kill them, sure. Um, so we've been leading, I've been leading an effort with some of the other leaders as well as some of the scout leaders to set up for our first virtual game day, which is going to be Monday, the December 28th. Our, our primary platform's board game arena with Discord as our communications. Um, and it's looking really good. Board game arena is really cool. There's some of the games you can play for free. Some of them, one player needs a premium subscription. So I have a premium sub, as does one of, one of the other leaders. But uh, there's there's some really great board games on there that I've actually always wanted to own. Uh that I've either played at my friendly local gaming store and I never got around to buying them or they went out of print. Now I can play them. Like there's this one stone age for instance, but uh, we've we discovered some cool games and what, what's different about this than like, you know, having them play call of duty together. Again, this is, these are board and card games that would be traditionally played in person, but instead it's a web-based service. Uh and then I think we're going to let them play. We're going to let it, we're going to run some rounds of Among Us as well, I think. But oh. it's it's kind of cool trying putting all this together because it's not as simple as here's a Discord channel. You guys go nuts. There's there's protocols. There's you got to make sure that there's never a single leader alone in one of the rooms with the scouts because uh, mm -hmm. youth protection. Yeah. You, you want to make sure that everybody's, you know, having a good time together and making it a, a positive experience because it's a, it's an official troop event. So that's um, it's not quite running a whole like virtual summit or or running something at that level, but it will be virtual uh, some some virtual chicken herding. I know that. Yeah, I bet. Especially when dealing dealing with Boy Scouts, I I mean but, from my from my yeah. own experience being a Boy Scout, I can only imagine the hell that the Scout Masters must go through. They're nah, the <laughs> these are these are good guys, but on the other hand, most of them are teenage boys, and teenage boys are kind of dumb. Mm -hmm. So I was one and my son used to be one until very recently. Now he's 18. But yeah, a lot of them, I've known them for years. I love them like sons, but there's a lot of them who are dumbasses. No question there. <laughs> but, you know, it's worth it because we show them how to not be such dumbasses throughout through the scouting program. So that's that's my big project. I've said up. this. I've said this many times to you and probably on the show that I think that scouting was one of the most valuable things I did as a, as a kid. It just taught me so many things some things that you can even repeat in public some things i can repeat in public <laughs> man had social media been a thing when i was a teenager i'd be in prison right now i'm pretty sure of that so uh not not to uh i don't know charles if you have things you want to chat or anything you're up to but i did want to mention because you said discord and it reminded me um not that i hate discord uh although i sometimes do but <laughs> i heard from <laughs> Via Twitter from Ed Scotus, who was on our show, of course, last time we recorded. Uh, you might remember we had a live question for Ed when, he, when we were talking about Holiday Hack uh, that folks were interested in him running a Discord or somebody running a Discord server to go along with Holiday Hack. And guess what? He took that feedback and they have a Discord server to go with Holiday Hack this year. And I do believe that it's open. I just opened up the website. It no longer says coming soon. I did not want to attempt to log into it now because it's going to play music and stuff uh and that would have gotten into recording you. and it would distract Bad me because host. i want to play but it is it looks like it's live now um i didn't follow up and look at ed's twitter feed or whatever but it sure looks like it's live so if you guys want to try out holiday hack this year it looks like it's up holidayhackchallenge.com slash 2020 i'll get you there i would like to okay so charles you have anything for chat not really um, um no no eh. You had something, but you deleted it. I don't know how many people really want to hear about it. Um, but the best college football game of the season was played this past Saturday. 
what made it the best college ball game of the season? Well, so this is uh, Brigham Young and Coastal Carolina. What's cool about it is that these teams were not scheduled to play. And normally, even normally games are scheduled years in advance. And even in this COVID affected season, there's still some notion of a schedule. But Coastal was supposed to play Liberty. Liberty had problems with COVID. They had to bail. And so Wednesday, it was the equivalent really of just the, the schools calling each other up and being like, yo, you want to do a game on Saturday? Hey, and you want to play? You want to play some football? What's cool is these are both <laughs> teams that are not perceived as being in the first rank, but they both had excellent seasons, were undefeated. And so Brigham Young set their equipment truck driving towards South Carolina, and they flew out for the game. And for like three hours on Saturday afternoon, he's had this remarkably physical and violent football game <laughs> from two teams that I don't think had ever played before. But boy, it looked like a rivalry by the second half. Wow. And it, the game ended on a very close play that was extremely well done, where a receiver almost made it into the end zone and was then dragged away from it by a couple of defenders as the <laughs> clock expired. It, Fellas, it was just a banger. I would watch this again on a Blu-ray. It was, it was great. That's cool. That's cool. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not I mean, as as you know, I'm not big into sports, especially yeah. football. I just, it's just not a thing I do. Mm-hmm. But uh, I do. I have been to a number of live, especially college football games. I don't think I've ever been to a pro a pro game, but I've been to a couple college games, and I gotta say, there's a certain amount of passion that still seems, mm-hmm. still seems active at a college. There's level. energy. Yeah, yeah, there's and live, what, live sports are a completely different world. And what's interesting about this is, you know, of course, there are very few fans in the stands, obviously. But, you know, there's a there's a um, sports discord um, part of, you know, it's a, it's a sports website that, whose Patreon I help support. And so there's a whole bunch of people in this discord watching the game together and talking about it. So you have that kind of sense of community and like nobody there was really like an absolute well, there are a few. Most people weren't really fans of BYU or Coastal, but they were just fans of watching a really good football game. Mm-hmm. And we were all had for like a couple hours there. We were all having just a fabulous time. You forgot cool. about all the nonsense we're going through, and it almost felt like a normal day. It didn't it? Didn't but because it was. It's not normal to have a game scheduled on three days' notice. It ought to be because no. that was amazing. But yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, got a good vibe coming out of that. It's cool. It makes me, it really makes me wonder what the world is going to be like when we're on the other side of all this. Like how much, how much of this is all going to stick? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, like that, what you were just describing. Are you, are you still going to be like, is that still going to be the experience that it was then? Right. In say a year from now, assuming mm-hmm. in a year from now, the, the vaccine hasn't gone horribly wrong and turned us all into zombies. <laughs> See, there's the zombies from. Uh, yeah. The I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that I think that's going to happen. I'm just saying, you know, like things can happen. Things can, can things, things can go wrong. Um, but anyway, um, like how much of the stuff that has changed because of the pandemic is going to stick with us for the rest of our known lives. Right. You know, like like virtual meetings, like work from home, like um, you know some of the advancements in just no touch things like payments and like whatever, or just like like the, the the general hygiene stuff. Like my, I, I had to take my daughter to the dentist for a checkup the other day, and when I walked in uh, for for the past eight months, every time I've been there, their waiting room has just been boarded up, like they literally put plywood across the entrance to their waiting room because they they it was just like a clear sign you're not allowed to be in this waiting room i came back and they've they've redesigned the waiting room so now it's just a little tiny bench no soft cushions no play area for the kids it's just a bench right and i commented like oh wow you guys did the whole waiting room over and it happened that the dentist who owns the practice was behind the counter doing some paperwork when i said it and he's like yeah i don't think that the waiting room experience is ever going to be what it used to be it's never going to go back to the way it was it's never going to be magazines and toys for the kids and whatever 
because it's too easy to spread a virus that way. So it just made me wonder, you know, like how much of that is going to stick with us? Are waiting rooms going to go back to the way they were? Is he wrong? I don't know. But uh, yeah, just made me curious. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I think that's uh, that's all the chat and all the whatever. We can get a, we can go ahead and get on into the news. Yeah, right? Okay. Oh man. So here we go to the news. I had this plan that was going to be really awesome for the live stream. And I'm not belaboring. I'm trying to be funny because we're doing this audio only now and I can't do it on the live stream now. But um, <clears throat> because of the next article that we're going to talk about, I was I, I was literally going to put on my welding gloves and coat and welding helmet to protect me from the flame. <laughs> 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 but I didn't do any of that because it's not going to matter now because <laughs> you can't see any of it. Uh, so... I just realized I actually don't have this open. Oh, here it is. Maybe you guys have heard, and the articles that we've linked, there are two of them, and we'll, we'll talk about what each of them are in a minute. Uh, the articles that we linked are from ZDNet, and the other one is from The Register. You may have heard that there is a change coming to the way CentOS is managed in the not-so-distant future. What is it, 2021, they're saying? They're at the end of, the end of 2021, I think, is supposed to change. For eight, for seven, it continues until 2024. Oh, right, right. Seven is unaffected, but eight is going to switch to CentOS Streams, which... Mm, that's not entirely true. Okay, you want to... You, you, okay. you can go ahead so, and talk about so, it, Mark. So, I'm on vacation. <laughs> so the, 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 problem, the problem is there's two different things. CentOS Streams is something that Red Hat announced a year ago and has been in use for for rel8 since that time and centos streams uh you get a lot of it's around where in the red hat production cycle things live so so when you talk about open source software at the very top the the the, the most forward thinking the, the the completely community driven version of linux that becomes Red Hat, that becomes RHEL, is Fedora. Mm -hmm. And and for your listeners who know this already, our listeners, right? Because I'm one of us now. For people who know this already, I apologize. But let me give you the 30-second overview. So Fedora is completely community-owned. Now, there are people who work at Red Hat that, as part of their job, they're allowed to work on Fedora. Like, we pay them to, to help. But Red Hat doesn't own Fedora. Everybody owns it. It's the planet's. Every couple of years, Red Hat takes the current version of Fedora, snapshots it, brings it into the lab, hardens it, enterprises it, drops features we don't think will work as an enterprise operating system, and then we release Red Hat Enterprise Linux. But here's the important part. All those changes, that source code for RHEL is under the GPL. So Red Hat releases the source code to its customers. Actually, Red Hat goes a step beyond what it's legally obligated to do. Red Hat puts the source code for RHEL on a public FTP server with no security lockdowns. So anybody on the planet can download the source code to RHEL. We give it away for free. We make Red, Red Hat, make, and I say we because for those of you who don't realize it because you've been asleep at the wheel, both Nate and I well, are employees. New. Yeah, we're employees <laughs> for Red Hat. I, I work for them. So, you know, I have to be careful what I say and Take what I say with a grain of salt, but I but I try to be as straight as I can with people, right? What what CentOS originally was is people took the source code for RHEL, stripped out the Red Hat trademark stuff in it, and then released CentOS. It was for community enterprise OS. And so it was it, we, it was basically talked about as a RHEL clone. So Red Hat would release RHEL release updates for RHEL or whatever, and the CentOS team would take that stuff, sent, uh, you know, do their stuff on it, CentOS and it. then CentOS it, right? And then it would be basically a, a compatible version of RHEL that you didn't have to pay any money to use because and to use RHEL, you're, you're supposed to pay a subscription. And effectively identical 
right? I mean, I've Effective. I've seen I've seen Rel clones that were not effectively yeah. identical. They're very very similar. You could tell they're the same yeah. base. The CentOS was effectively, I mean, all the bits except for like subscription management and a few other little things and the way you had to get certain pieces of software otherwise functionally identical. Right. And so so what Red Hat has decided is that they no longer oh, okay, now now we have now here's where we get into the contention, right? A couple of years back, Red Hat actually acquired CentOS including the trademark and we were we were helping them with their process and stuff. Why would we do that? Well, because it was thought, you know, it, it was some goodwill. And it was also a way, if scent looked good, people would use it. And then maybe, you know, pivot to the commercial product. Because Red Hat's a company. They, they want to make money. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you can, it can be your opinion that there's something wrong with that. But that's not my opinion. Companies exist to make money to drive the economy. Um. So what, what Red Hat has decided is that we want, what we want to invest our money in is CentOS Stream, which instead of coming out after RHEL, is a little, it comes out before RHEL, but not crazy before. And it, it all the software that's, gonna, that's in CentOS Stream goes through the same quality process that stuff that lands in actual RHEL does. It's like it's like a minor version ahead ish because it's also not going to be it's also not minor versions. It's it's a roll. It's I hate the term rolling because it implies non stability. But as updates are approved and 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 get through QE, they go into the stream. Um, and this has upset some people. No. Who would it have who would it possibly have upset? Everybody so, is the right answer. Right, right. Uh, there the are. The, yeah. The perception have, is that. Yeah. Oh, you go ahead. Cause... I've 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 seen accusations flying all over the place. In fact, groups that I'm part of that know that I work for Red Hat have have like directly called me out. It's like, what the hell's going on here? Because they think I know something more than what's what's public. And maybe I could know more than what's public if I weren't on vacation. But. Uh, when I'm on vacation, I turn off my work email and I do my best to not look at it. <laughs> and rightly yeah. so. Yeah, but uh, but anyway, um, so yeah, there are people accusing Red Hat of of doing this solely from a profit perspective that we're trying to keep people away from CentOS, make it less less attractive. There's people accusing uh, IBM of putting their fingers into the pot and 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 causing trouble for for CentOS because they want to sell more rel even though it doesn't quite work that way <laughs> so so let, and let me be clear of what red hat's actually doing because right. i don't know if we stated it exactly so red hat for a year has been putting effort into centos stream and we said at that time that centos the classic one would continue it was since decided and this was a decision that was not an edict. I, I, I can't go complete. Yeah, I got to be careful what I say, but it is not an evil plan by IBM. I can, I can assure you of that. Um, but what Red Hat is doing is they are, the efforts of focusing on CentOS Stream, uh, the lifespan of CentOS 8 was going to be, the community inferred that it was going to be till 2029. Well, Red Hat's going to stop providing engineering efforts at the end of 2021 and red hat is not giving the CentOS trademark back to the community. So a group of people can't just pick the CentOS trademark up and keep doing it on their own. And I think that more than anything is probably upsetting a lot of people. So that that's, what's going on. Okay. So CentOS, as we know it, CentOS eight, as we know it, uh, is likely going to change somewhere between now and the end of 2021. Does that mean that it's going to be gone? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know if nobody's we have an answer go, to that. Yeah, no, nobody's going to go to your computer and delete it, but there won't be any more. What I mean is, will there not be an alternative is the thing that I don't know that we have an answer to, um, but it's not impossible. It's It's possible that the the... I mean, we've seen this happen with open source projects so many times where direction changes. I mean, look at, what was it? Debian. When Debian embraced System D, 
What happened? Some people who were loyalists, loyalists, whatever, some people who loved the old init system uh, forked Debian and they made their own system that did not use systemd, right? So there's really nothing, and this is conjecture on my part, there's nothing to do with anything I've read internally. Like I said, I haven't looked at any of the internal threads about this stuff. There's nothing to say that CentOS, the project, CentOS 8, does not continue under a different name, under different direction, right? Well, so... That is, yeah, that that is a fairly true statement. What the, what can happen is they can't is the 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 group that is now the CentOS project can't continue to use the CentOS trademark, right? Because it's owned by Red Hat now. So and I could... think the idea is is Red Hat doesn't want they want to make it perfectly clear that that CentOS the old way is no longer going to be a thing after a shorter period of time. Right. Than, than originally thought. And they don't want any dilution there. And on the other hand, people who are doomsaying about CentOS streams, that still sounds like a perfectly viable option. Right? It's not... So, I am not a developer. Let me put it this way. I'm not a good developer. <laughs> and, and there are some objections around the fact that since streams is a header rel... You can't promise that the, the thing about CentOS is you could say if it runs on CentOS, it'll run on RHEL. Right. And that was mostly true, right? Sometimes there were minor incompatibilities. It was mostly true because you could say that because CentOS was older than RHEL. And that's the way the compatibility works. It's, RHEL has always been backwards compatible. If I compile something on RHEL 8.2, it'll still run on 8.4. Right. I can't make the same state. If, I've, if I compile something on RHEL 8.4, I actually can't promise it'll run on rel 8.2. And that's kind of what's going to happen with CentOS Stream. It's, since it's going to be ahead of it, there'll be there'll be changes to libraries. There might be some new things interjected where it won't necessarily be completely compatible with production rel. But now, do I think that's going to happen often? No, not at these all. Are, these are also things that once they hit CentOS Streams are probably coming to rel soon. Yes. Right. And in fact, so, if you follow the software life cycle, we've got the dev test prod model. It actually seems to me to make more sense intuitively to have CentOS stream. If you're doing development work on that, be slightly ahead of production because that's what production is going to be next time. There's a patch release for and this. This makes that's, me, that's really, yeah, this makes me curious. And again, complete conjecture on my part. This is not any kind of internal red hat, anything talking. It makes me wonder if the focus on streams is going to become what RHEL is, right? Is RHEL eventually going to be a streams-based distribution? I don't know. You know, that it kind of makes me curious just from a from a, a projecting standpoint, right? Like, is this is this the sort of model that we can expect? Because we already see it with other distributions. Um, do we see it with other enterprise-level distributions? I don't know. I don't know. I think what we're seeing is Ubuntu we are uses seeing, this model, doesn't it? Yeah, we're seeing a change in the way software is developed. If you're Chris Wright wrote a blog about this, it's a high level thing, and and switching to CentOS Stream is basically trying to say, look, we don't we don't develop and and deploy software the same way today that we did even five years ago. Mm -hmm. And Red Hat wants to stay relevant. We want to stay ahead of the curve, right? And part of that's because we're not just a Linux company anymore. We've got mm -hmm. things like you know, OpenShift and the and the other types of technologies like that. That that whole hybrid cloud thing, which starts to turn into marketing speak. But I I get I get why it's why we say that, and it's it's not as simple as just being a Linux company anymore. And in fact, this actually I would argue, and people have argued that the stream model is more open source because once stuff got to CentOS, if I'm a CentOS user and I file a bug against it, Red Hat don't care. It has to go all the way around the process all over again. Mm -hmm. But CentOS stream, because it's in front of RHEL, that the the engineering work goes in there. So bugs that are addressed in CentOS stream might never even hit RHEL. You mean the bug itself may never hit? Yeah, RAL. yeah. Like it'll be fixed before it gets there. It'll be fixed before it hits RAL. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, that could mean that you're taking an extra risk because this is stuff that 
you know, hasn't been... So currently CentOS is tested with RHEL before it hit CentOS, right? So it's like it hit all of Red Hat's customers. All like like the major, oh my God, the world's burning down, was handled when customers got it and opened support cases and whatever, right? And right. then it eventually made it to CentOS, right? So basically what this means now is that CentOS is going to be the place where that stuff's happening, right? Potentially. New packages come in. Oh my I, God. Yeah. However, when you... Th Think about that model that almost makes more sense, doesn't it? And keep in mind, CentOS Stream is free. Yeah. It's not... That's what I'm, that's no what I'm one, getting no at, one has right? To, no one has to pay to use it. Yeah, the model is CentOS is free, right? So right now, what you're getting is arguably a better tested <laughs> OS than even RHEL was, right? Because things get through, you know they get through. They get to rel release, and then oh my god, the world's burning. We got to fix a problem. It gets fixed. Maybe that never makes it to CentOS, or it takes a long time because it I, gets I fixed know. quicker. Right, it gets fixed quickly enough if it's a big enough problem that it doesn't make it to CentOS. It never gets repackaged and put out as, as, as CentOS code. So now the difference is that the one you're not paying for is the one that's going to get those problems first. <laughs> Yeah, And I understand how if you're running an enterprise on CentOS, that's a problem for you. Um, and I don't want to come off like, you, you cheap son of a bitch, why are you not paying for RHEL? But doesn't the model make more sense this way? I don't know. And, and you and I are dangerously close to being just doing internal chatter right now. And I kind of, I'm interested in Charles's perception yes. because he's not, he's not <laughs> colored from being a Red Hat employee. Does Charles even care? I think Charles cares. He brought it up before we had the show. <laughs> so I, I want to shut up and let Charles talk. Yeah. Well, and it's, so I come from the perspective of having been having used RHEL at my current place of employment for the last nearly nine years. Um, done a few things with CentOS back when I was rolling um, Vagrant distributions test things but i don't do that anymore and for the last year year and a half i'm building stuff on aws using amazon linux 2 which of course is downstream of rel um so i have no particular strong emotional connection to centos and i will take everything you say about the direction of these various projects as read um i Having having a CentOS stream being kind of the bleeding edge and exposed to the outside world, I can see the logic. I can see the inherent criticism that it's you're basically you know you're getting free beta testing, but it, it's open source, folks. At some point, if you don't pay for it, that that will happen. Um, you know, you're still getting a you're still getting a fairly good product uh for free mm -hmm. and potentially as you say potentially with the opportunity to um contribute back bug fixes like i don't know um the counter argument might be there would be fewer bugs but i can certainly say the experience of reporting bugs with rel was horrible um from my perspective um, I don't know. It could just be that a lot of the bugs I had were weird, but and hard to reproduce. Yeah. So I don't. I don't know that I see the sky is falling. Um, I think that there there's a tendency to have this kind of knee jerk reaction when it's like essentially when a thing happens, like when somebody does a thing, um, like when Microsoft bought GitHub. And you saw a slurry of people announcing they were migrating their projects elsewhere because, you know, it's Microsoft. And, ah, and you know, we're a few years in now. And um, I don't think Microsoft destroyed GitHub. Um, it, it doesn't look destroyed to me where I'm sitting. Um, I think people, to some extent, I'm not going to look. It, so, it's, a it's a change. It's easy to scream about it. And it can look bad. And the messaging around, like, 
the explanation I've heard here tonight is more coherent than anything I've read thus far. Well, yeah. and here's the thing. I think we've shit the bed when it comes to the message. I don't <laughs> think Red Hat's done a great job delivering the message. And that is, Nate, when you get back in the office and you read some of the internal discussion, we acknowledge, yeah, this could have been handled better. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, I, 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 the, the first thing I read about it after somebody called me out in one of the Slack groups that I'm in um, was uh, the official sent us uh, announcement on their website. And it did not sound good. It sounded pretty bad. In fact, at the at the like toward the end of it, there was a there was a it was it was worded in such a way where it's like if you don't like this, no, it wasn't if you don't like this. If you have concerns about the stability of CentOS streams, you should contact Red Hat. And it was really Ooh. it was thrown out there as like a you're getting this for free. You should probably go buy it if you want to, <laughs> if, if you want a uh, a stable operating system. And that is not the right message to send here. Well, stay and stable is an irritating word sometimes because yeah. CentOS streams, Facebook is running on CentOS streams. Yeah, yeah. There's 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 people are running production workloads on this stuff. It's not beta. It's not. Yeah, no, you know, that's. And that's and that's so, where there's a perception problem. I mean, it may not look that way when there's a huge problem, when there's a when there's a bug that looks like it should have been caught in QA. It may not look this way, but I can assure you that packages that make it into RHEL. They're pretty damn well tested before they come to a release. Yes, things. And get we by. still have bugs. If we, we still have, have a bugs. lot of bugs. That's what I'm saying. Yes, things get by. I don't think that what this means is that CentOS is going to turn into this wild, wild west, bug-ridden pile of steaming garbage just because it's before RHEL. If we follow the same no. procedures that we follow now before they hit CentOS streams, you're still going to get a very stable software base. You're not going to get beta software. You're not going to get a development platform. You're going to get what would have been RHEL, which is pretty damn stable. It's just gonna be. It's gonna. It's gonna come to CentOS streams before it goes to RHEL, which means that again, it gives you an option to report problems before they hit an enterprise level operating system, right? So you can actually affect change in RHEL by affecting change in CentOS. So change is hard, but here's the thing. Now, now we can quote Jeff Goldblum: "Life will find a way." Life will find. The a very way. next news article basically says, "Well." Okay, um, the original creator of, of, of CentOS is already at it. So this is an article from the Register. Uh, Gregory Kurtzer, the founder of the CentOS project, has kicked off a new venture called Rocky Linux, the aim being to build a community enterprise operating system designed to be 100% bug-for-bug bug compatible with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Bug for bug, and it's named after it's named after his uh, former co-founder Rocky McGow, who passed away some time ago. I was curious not, about the name. Not, yeah, it's not Rocky because it, they intended to be a difficult journey. It's 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 in tribute. I was thinking about the uh, the squirrel. So, so for folk who liked the downstream rel rel clone, work has already begun on it. Yeah, and this is really exactly what the point I was trying to make before. I, I really think it's unlikely that there will be no alternative to fill the old CentOS 8 void when CentOS Streams becomes the focus. I think it's unrealistic to believe that there will just be no option there. There's already talk about one. <laughs> yeah. What What's irritating to me and I'm really trying to keep my mouth shut on social media is there's a whole bunch of people who've been jumping out of the woodwork going, aha, I told you this is all IBM's fault. We always knew Red Hat was just in it for the Benjamins. And this is just an effort to kill any free rails, which is just not the case. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, 
and quite frankly, for years, people have been running their enterprise stuff on free rel and not giving back in any way, shape, or form by using CentOS. Not everybody, but a lot of people. And I think, you know, the the article that I just linked from the register, you know, why not just switch to rel? A lot of smaller companies like the one I work for are not going to say that is a viable use of money. A lot of money for something that CentOS was providing free of charge. So basically people got used to having the the high the, the item that was the same technical quality free of charge. And of course they're going to be mad that that's taken away. Mm-hmm. Honestly though, um, this is, this is the way things go when you've got a free sir, a, a free product, right? Things can change. Um, you don't, yeah, there, there's a lot of ways that you have uh, more control over it. If you contribute to the project, but there's a lot of ways you have less control because you're not contributing financially, right? Where, where, Red Hat customers can jump up and down and say, we're taking our money elsewhere, and that actually has weight. CentOS doesn't have that. CentOS has a community, right? So, but anyway, I feel like I can take my uh, my, my proverbial flame suit off now, <laughs> and perhaps we can move along into our next article, which is from Ars Technica. Uh, COVID data manager investigated, rated for using publicly available password. Charles, did you say you included this in the notes? I included it, but I'll freely admit I never, I like scanned the article, but um, like like there's a lot, there's a lot of layers to this. Um, So the, yeah, so the, the woman in question was the per- was the person who created Florida's COVID dashboard and was then fired for mm. you know not being um, I forget exactly why basically because um, she was not going along with the party line that you know things are fine in Florida and she's like no they're not they're terrible um, but. Uh, I did. I did hear somebody, uh, yes. a little bit about somebody. this, and mm-hmm. yeah. So uh, it's it sounded like after she was fired, she went back and continued to use some of the data because there was a publicly accessible username and password. Um. So. No. Um, no. Okay. Seven. Um. A couple thousand people. Florida's emergency response team received a communication. Um. That urge recipients to speak up before, you know, more people are dead, that sort of thing, you know, kind of a call to action. Um, mm-hmm. But the thing is, there is one single username and password um, that is used for, by everybody for the system, that username and password, I guess, is included in some internal documentation that was publicly available on a website. Ah. Uh. Oops. Now they're saying they've correlate, they've got IP address information. And that's why they rated her. But mm-hmm. um, I, sure, guys. But it, you, you posted the username and password. Anybody could have done it. No, it was totally her. It had to be her because she's so disgruntled. Mm-hmm. Like, and so our sending has this screenshot of the of the document. Where it's yeah, like, I'm yeah, looking at the, it. The, the username and password are just right there. Yeah, just like right there. Username, <sighs> colon, password, colon, cert, login. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, oh, great. I work for a small liberal arts college, and we've got, like, defense in depth, you know, single sign-on, two-factor, all this stuff. It's like, nah, eh, I just got username and password on a PDF on a website. Brilliant. Yeah, but you, I mean, in, in the college's defense, you had some pretty tech or some pretty uh, paranoid uh, people running the show for quite a long time. Yes, paranoid is the word you were looking for. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we kept all, it's not like we tore that stuff down after you left. Yeah, right? Right? So all the paranoia is still helping you. Your usernames and passwords are not accessible on the web. <laughs> we hope not. <laughs> you hope. You hope. <laughs> I've always said it's okay to publish passwords as long as you don't say what they're for. 
Yeah, right. Here's a password. I'm not going to tell you where, where you can use it. Uh, all right. So the last article we've got is from Eurogamer. This feels like a Mark article. Mark, did you add this? No. Charles? I, I just I just thought I'd mention, because it seemed like a nice thing to mention, and we don't really have to talk uh-huh. about it, is that Perfect Dark is being remade. Oh, okay. And that was I don't a, think I ever played Perfect Dark. That was a fabulous game. You know, cause it was the spiritual sequel to GoldenEye. Okay. So it was kind of a sci-fi, um, sci-fi setting. Interesting. It was great. Nice. But Goldeneye, no one's, that. no one's touching that, huh? Goldeneye, nah. I like you can't you can't remake Perfection. You'd think no. somebody would try. You would think. There's nothing like, oh, wrong this game with was, that. This game was really successful. We should make another one and call it the same thing. Everybody will love it. Because we see how much you see how much you see how much Star Wars fans love the Mandalorian and hate the Mandalorian. <laughs> Who hates the Mandalorian? I uh, just every time there's an episode, there's there seems to be a a, a fire. There's storm. always the one edge. There's always the one edge lord who has to. Well, I don't like the Mandalorian. Right. No, I love well, no, the first I mean, season, and I haven't gotten around to the second season. I'm it's I'm good. still behind by one episode. I have to I have to check out last week's episode. So nobody but talk about the second season. It's well, so it's quite, I'll I'll talk about it only in the controversy that has exploded. There have been several episodes where it's like this thing happened. Oh my God! We have to be outraged for that. This other thing. I got happened. no time for that. We have to be outraged about that, right? And it's and I've always said that science fiction fans are the most loyal and the most critical fans you'll ever come across. It happens with Star Trek. It happens with Star Wars, and there's a couple other things, you know, that are not quite as big as those two names. That it happens. You see it in every one of these communities where it's like this. Also happens in football. To be clear. Okay. <laughs> Fandoms. Yes. Well, I don't know if you guys saw uh, that Disney has apparently been dropping lots of announcements. Mm-hmm. Seen some of that. Yeah. So Star Wars Andor, Star Wars A Droid Story, Star Wars The Bad Batch, Star Wars Ahsoka, Star Wars Acolyte, Star Wars Obi-Wan Kenobi, Lando, Rangers of the New Republic, Rogue Squadron, and Visions. Visions. All gonna be some all gonna be limited Star Wars. I think Rogue Squadron's gonna be a Rogue movie. Stuff. Yeah. Possibly. No, I am I don't know, man. My my Star Wars fandom's in a weird place right now. But uh some of these properties I'm very some of these things I'm very excited about. Yeah, I saw the the, the Kenobi one I saw an, an announcement for and it looked I'd watch it. <laughs> It sounds it sounds like a fun thing. I'd love to know more about Kenobi, you know, and all those other ones you just rattled off. Some of them sound very interesting. Other ones sound like they're just trying to capitalize on as much of the <laughs> as much of their purchase of the uh, the copyright as they can. You know, you know what? Dave Filoni, who did Clone Wars, who did Rebels, who's mm-hmm. doing the Mandalorian, he can make whatever the hell he wants as far as I'm concerned. Oh, that dude very loves good Star instinct. Wars. He loves Star Wars. He understands Star Wars. He understands why it's great. I don't care. He he can keep making it. Yeah, I understand yeah, I mean, some I... of the objections about the newer movies, and I even agree with some of those objections. But Filoni, just give him give him root. Don't even give him pseudo. Give him root. <laughs> you can you can trust this man. <laughs> Filoni is allowed. He, Filoni is allowed to log in his root. Baloney has received the usual lecture from his system administrator. The usual lecture that no one ever gives. He has never ever received. Him. Does anyone ever receive the usual lecture? <laughs> I told Andy don't break stuff when we hired him. There you go. There's the lecture. He didn't listen either. No. I've got stories. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't share them on a show though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think we've covered We actually had, a, believe it or not, a short amount of news, but we covered it in just the same amount of long time, so <laughs> because of the CentOS thing. Uh, let me get back to my notes here. All right, so folks, I hope you guys have enjoyed the show. I'm sorry again that we couldn't do it live, but at least you're getting the usual recording, which is 
to be honest, the way most of you guys are listening to the show anyway, and we appreciate all of you. Um, I really do. I did miss the the interactive nature of the live show to the, this week, and I'm really hoping that by the time we come back in January, I can get that worked out, and uh, we can be doing live shows again because I pay for restream now, and I don't. That's a waste of money if we're not streaming anymore. <laughs> Uh, so if you do want to watch the live shows, assuming we fix them, uh, you can find them roughly the second and fourth Thursday of every month on YouTube and on Twitch. There's links for those in the notes for this show. Uh, I'm also streaming to our Facebook page. So if you want to go find us on any of those social platforms, whether it's Twitch or YouTube or Twitter or Facebook, uh, you'll find ways to watch the show. Um, also, of course, you can just go download the show and listen to it after the fact, which is what you're going to do this time because... Well, I've already told you. If you want to join our Matrix, commu Matrix community, you can do so by going to uh, ironsystemmed.com. I think it's... Do I still have a link? Well, there's a link in the menu there. I was going to say I used to have a redirect. I don't think I have the redirect anymore. But there is a link to the community because the link is too big to try to read off on the air. Uh, like I said, Facebook and Twitter, you can find us there. Subscribe to us wherever you would normally find your podcasts. And if you don't find us, please reach us out. Please reach out to us and let us know that uh, you couldn't find us on whatever platform you're looking for us on. And we'll figure out how to get listed there as well. And with that, I think that's everything, folks. Um, Good yeah. times. Good times. So thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll see you. See you next year. On right? The, on the next show. And I just... I just realized that because we usually do the live stream, I don't have the outro music here. Ba -ba! Ba -da 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 <laughs> breaking the law, breaking the law. Breaking the law. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs> good night.